Thank you very much for this kind invitation. I am delighted to join you today with so many friends. Uh, and uh, usually, as you said, uh, I uh, speak or write on the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Oman, published in professional journals on Lebanon, although not a formal book. But since I've been stuck uh, here in Beirut uh, during the past five months because of the corona um, uh, virus, I've been following what's going on here very carefully. And uh, I have, as you said, co-written co a, a, an essay on corruption. Now, of course, uh, one, when one is an eyewitness to the collapse of an entire society, as unfortunately I have now become an eyewitness to this collapse, especially after the 17th October 2019 uprisings in the streets of uh, Beirut that saw at the beginning almost two, two and a half million individuals running through the streets of downtown Beirut. One takes an interest in finding out why Lebanon is, is uh, going through all of this trouble. And, and Lebanon suffers from systematic corruption. And of course, this did not occur during the past six months or during the past six years. One, one can easily say that corruption in Lebanon is a century old phenomenon ever since the greater Lebanon was declared by the French back in, on September 1st, uh, 1920. Uh, two months from now, the Lebanese are gonna celebrate their centenary of the declaration of the greater Lebanon. And it has always been a very corrupt society. The tragedy of course is that without realizing what was going on in the country, the sophisticated people have essentially enslaved themselves to the system without realizing that doing so would weaken their economy, their political system, their socio-religious background. All of this is gonna, has in fact gone tremendously down during the past century. Now what I plan to do very briefly today uh, before we open for, for discussion, I want to touch on three main areas of corruption. One could write volumes and volumes, and we don't have time to do that. I want to touch on economic corruption and why this is really the heart of the matter, then talk about political corruption uh, and what can be done to fix the system, and then talk about something which very few scholars have addressed, namely corruption within the clergy, within the religious establishment. Um, you know, people, people who, who, people of the cloth, they're always, they're always hiding behind divinity. But in fact, in a country like Lebanon, it is very easy to see how even they participate in the corrupt system in the country. So without further ado, let me just jump into the matter uh, at hand and discuss first economic corruption. Now, the administration, uh, as we all know, is, is, uh, is balanced out between the 18 communities that make up this country. There are 18 religious communities that essentially have split the economic pie of the country. For example, the president has always to be a Maronite Christian. The prime minister has always got to be a Sunni Muslim and the a speaker of the parliament has always got to be uh, a Shia Muslim. Now, of course, you've heard all of this before, but I wish it was that simple because in the administration, economic, economic departments, various political departments are all also distributed according to the quotas that each religious community has taken. For example, if the minister of finance is a Shia Muslim, the director of the Department of Finance has got to be a Baronet Christian. And down the list it goes. If the commander of the army, who is always a Maronite Christian, the chief of staff of the armed forces has always got to be a Druze. So therefore, the economic corruption that surrounds the administration is ingrained. This is something that that's built in the system. And that's something which is incomprehensible to most people that live outside in normal societies where competence is the requirement 
and not one's religious affiliation to qualify for a particular post. If, for example, they were to have, uh, for administrative purposes, uh, examinations to find out who are the best qualified individuals, and if that individual happens to be from the wrong community for that particular position, well, that qualified individual will not get that post in the administration. Someone else will get that post, even though that person might not be as qualified. Now, of course, before I talk about the real big uh, burden on the economy, which is electricity, I want to mention one more thing about the administration to show you how corrupt the system is. The government of Lebanon makes its resources, it earns its, its resources from a variety of taxes, whether it's VAT taxes, value added taxes on goods, on imports, uh, on goods, uh, luxury goods and so on. But the most important source of income for the country is land registration. Land registration is the, the mother load of, of the economy here, which means that if, for example, I have to have, I have a, a piece of land, first of all, I need to build on it, I need to register it, I need to pay taxes on it, I need to pay bribes on it, I need to do a whole bunch of stuff to bring electricity to the building, to bring water to the building, to get the police off my back when, they are, when the building is going on, etc., etc. But that's, again, the tip of the iceberg, because when I die, uh, property tax must be paid, so-called death tax, by my survivors. Whoever inherits that piece of land will have to go through the whole process of registering once again and pay to the state additional taxes. In other words, death taxes perpetuate. And this corruption is so ingrained in the system that now most people, to avoid that, uh, give their inheritors uh, the, the, the land before they die so that they don't have to incur additional taxes. And again, this is just one source of income. The other two major sources of income for the government are the import taxes that are collected at the harbor and the airport. And both, again, are super corrupt institutions. In, if you want to bring a container, let's say, of spaghetti from Italy, and you have to pay taxes, obviously, import taxes on the container of spaghetti. But if you have the right connection at the harbor, mm. you either don't pay any taxes on that container of spaghetti, or you pay very minimal taxes on that container of spaghetti. So therefore, the government loses a great deal of income because of the 18 communities and how they're controlling the ports of entries in the country, the harbor and the airport. And of course, Lebanon is a very small country. There is only one airport, uh, international airport, where, where goods come in, fresh, fresh items, and then one major harbor. There are small harbors, of course, but most of the, most of the containers go to the big harbor. Let me give you even a worse scenario agriculture, corruption in agriculture. In Lebanon, if you are a professional grower, let's say, of apples, well, you can grow apples in two specific areas of Lebanon. Everybody else is not allowed to grow apples. Only these two communities are allowed to grow apple for sale purposes. Of course, if you have a piece of land on which you as an individual would like to plant a couple of apple trees, you can do that, but not for commercial purposes. Likewise, if somebody wants to grow and sell tomatoes, well, you cannot do it everywhere. <laughs> that is reserved for certain communities and only in specific areas, agriculture is divided so that everybody gets a share of the pie so that everybody is happy and the system, the corrupt system serves everyone in the community. Nobody can complain. That's the whole purpose of corruption. Now, I want to say one more thing before I go to electricity. Now, we always assume, of course, that uh, Levantines are 
uh, are smart investors, they are they're clever businessmen, and they are, there's no doubt about that. Levantines are known for, for being uh, successful business leaders, and they make lots of, lots of money, they, they trade, uh, and, and they're successful. But the problem comes in where you have this monopoly where approximately 4,000 families control over 90% of the economy of the country. 4,000 families control 90% of the economy of Lebanon. Now, if, if on the average you're talking about five persons per family, you, you are essentially saying 20,000 people control a population of 5 million citizens. Of course, there are more people that live in Lebanon than the 5 million citizens. I estimate the population of this country to be about 8 million because you have the Palestinian refugees, you have Syrian refugees, you have foreign workers from all over the world, including India. Uh, and, and you have a whole bunch of people that come in and out, you know, Americans, Brits, you name it, everybody is here. This has become sort of, kind of human Disneyland of the entire Middle East, where you have all these people roaming around from fantasy land to future land to tomorrow land. This is what this country is. It's a mini, it's a mini uh, Disney, electricity. Now, in the, economic, in the economic arena, look how sophisticated the thievery of the corruption has reached. Lebanon spends $2 billion a year to buy fuel to run its electric generators in order to provide electricity. Over a course of 30 years, they've spent over $40 billion. And that money has evaporated into smoke, literally. Now, of course, Lebanon doesn't need to spend all that money. And, and uh, most of that money went into the pockets of corrupt politicians who have helped themselves to the public treasury and with impunity because there is no accountability. There is no parliamentary investigation. There is absolutely no accountability when it comes to how the annual budget is, is uh, served. So this gives you an idea of the economic morass in which the country is. Let me turn to the political uh, bribery. And I'm going to start where it hurts most. And it hurts with the military. Look, in most societies, the military are, are supposed to be the creme de la creme, where people go to, to defend the land, the country, to, to devote themselves to the welfare of society. Well, because being in the military is so lucrative for those who join, they get all kinds of benefits. Bribery at the military academy has become a rampant phenomenon. Families actually pay officers money to get their kids inside the military academies so that their future is guaranteed. And eventually, you know, I don't know how many generals there are in this country, but they're all over the place. There are thousands upon thousands of individuals who are generals. There are very few colonels, incidentally, and that's done on purpose. You know why? Because colonels make coup d'etats, and you don't want that. Generals, you know, generals are friends of ours. We can bring them into the system. We can bribe them very easily. And when they reach a certain level in the military, they don't want to rock the boat because their privileges at that time will diminish. That's why you don't want colonels. There are very few colonels. Immediately when they stay two, three years as colonel, you promote them to general. That way they are part of the system. Now, the political uh, bribery, as I said, is all over the place. Parliament is a very good example of that. The same faces get elected year after year to Parliament. The last time in 2018, only one out of 128 members of Parliament came from a non-governmental organization, from civil society, essentially. One candidate won. 127 thieves with one civil society parliamentarian who obviously was emasculated, could not do anything, and, ha and has been in, in, incapable to change the system. Before the parliamentary election, the laws were changed and literally rigged in such a way 
that the same individuals got reelected in bizarre combinations of alliances. Enemies in one uh, community were allies in another. In one city, two parties that were competing with each other or against each other, in another city or another governorate, the same parties were friends. You know, try to figure this out. You have two major parties that are essentially sharing the pie, agreeing in some areas and disagreeing in other areas. And of course, vote buying is very common. Uh, in 2018, the average vote went for $100 per person. That's very cheap when you think about it, but obviously blackmail is something very common. Now, the corruption goes throughout, throughout the hierarchy, of course, of the political establishment. The Financial Times a couple of days ago had an interview with the Director General, the Lebanese Director General, the Minister of Finance, a gentleman by the name of Alain Bifani, who resigned. Uh, his resignation, incidentally, has still not been accepted by the government. They are still debating whether they will allow him to resign. Because the fear is, if he spills the beans, obviously everybody will be caught red-handed. So they're trying to keep him away. But in the Financial Times a couple of days ago, this gentleman revealed that since October 17, 2019, anywhere between five and six billion dollars were taken out of Lebanon in the banking system. How could that possibly be when, when the, the economy has hit the tank and everybody is in trouble, uh, the, the, the dollar has shot up, the Lebanese pound has lost 75% of its values, of its value in less than six months. Uh, prices are rocketing. The official peg to the Lebanese pound versus the dollar is 1,500, but on the black market, it's anywhere between 8,000 and 10,000 on any given day. So you can imagine the disparity that exists in the economy. When the political establishment is very much at ease, they have no problems and th there is no urgency to fix anything. And the international community that wants to help the International Monetary Fund, the uh, Friends of Lebanon that have uh, met at the Paris uh, agreements, Paris 1, 2, 3, and then the latest one said, all of these commitments have been made to come to the assistance, financial assistance of the country, but conditioned that in fact Lebanon would make, would introduce certain reforms. And none of the reforms that people promised occurred. And there is no urgency. A new government came into place since February of 2020. So therefore, they've been in power now for almost five months. And although the prime minister, sadly, a professor, a former professor at the American University of Beirut claimed in public that he has accomplished 97% of all the things he promised. Let me repeat that. The prime minister is on record for saying, I have accomplished 97% of all the reforms. <laughs> and observers are saying, show us one, <laughs> not 97%, show us one reform that you did so that we can give you money, uh, so that we can help you. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is willing to pledge almost $10 billion to assist Lebanon to overcome the current difficulty, but obviously based on certain reforms and so on and so forth, including reforms in the electricity so that $2 billion don't disappear in smoke every year, nothing happens. Now, of course, so far I've spoken about the economy and I've spoken about uh, about uh, the political area, but I did not mention the kind of elephant in the room. And there is a big elephant in the room. The elephant is Hezbollah, the party of God. Now, of course, um, Lebanon has allowed all of the militias 
to surrender their arms after resolution 1559 was passed, but it made, it made an exception to Hezbollah, which is a Shiite party, a religious party, but I'm not talking about the religious affiliation, I'm talking about the political affiliation. It is very much pro-Iran, and it pursues in Lebanon, Iran's political agenda, political and military agenda. Hezbollah is supported by a group of Lebanese, no doubt about that, but not the majority. The vast majority of Lebanese are opposed to it, especially the fact that under 1559, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1559, all of the militias had to surrender their weapons to the Lebanese army, but Hezbollah was made an exception. The exception occurred because, remember, I'm sure all of you know this, but just for uh, me memory, to, to rekindle our memories, Lebanon was occupied by Syria for 30 years. And under Syrian tutelage, obviously the government at the time was obligated to tolerate the presence of Hezbollah's arms. Today, this is coming to hurt. And Hezbollah is also a very corrupt institution. Right now, for example, with the fluctuation of the dollar, it is the primary party that is smuggling dollars, collecting the dollars on the market and sending them to Syria because Syria needs hard currency given the uh, very stiff sanctions that the international community led by the United States has imposed on Syria. The Syrians need dollars in order to purchase essentials for their society. Where are they going to get the dollars from? Well, next door, Lebanon, which had a lot of dollars in its banking system. Most people, 70% of the Lebanese, <coughs> excuse me, 70% of the Lebanese had banking, bank accounts in dollar currency, not Lebanese pound currency, and at very high interest. So therefore, there were about, there were about $175 billion circulating in Lebanon. Not anymore, of course, those days are gone. Hezbollah creates a corruption problem of exceptional quality. It is exceptional quality. And all of the sanctions that the international community members are imposing on this country have still not been able to make a dent in the Lebanese political system whereby people say, enough is enough. The last point I want to talk about, as I said, the third corruption system. In fact, as I was talking to you, I'm sure you listened. My UPS, that means electricity, is gone. Uh, so now the solar panel has kicked in and the batteries are working. And you can see me thanks to the batteries because the state the state electricity has been cut. It happens about 10 times a day. Uh, so we're used to it. We have, if I did not have this UPS machine, the picture now would have disappeared from the screen. But to circumvent this on every machine, on television, on computers, you have to have batteries in order for it to kick in and, and, and until the solar system picks up. Anyway, most people, if you talk to the Lebanese that live in this country, most people will have horror stories to tell you there are people who cannot afford to have these solar panels and, and batteries as backup, which means they stay in the dark for hours and hours and hours. Lebanon has really lost the opportunity to, to uh, preserve its sophisticated society. The third group of political of corruption are the clergy. And I want to talk about this because some, this is not something that you hear very often. Now, I don't want you to misread what I'm about to tell you. I'm a believer and I am not talking against any religion. I'm a believer and I respect all faiths and I respect everybody's faith. And I have no, no objections to whatsoever. I'm only talking about the clergy's political role. What are the clergymen, both Christian and Muslim, what are they doing to the corrupt system in which they live? Are they doing something about it? And I will tell you what, is, what they're doing. First, 
40% of the land of Lebanon does not belong to the people of Lebanon. It belongs to the churches. It belongs to the clergy, both Muslim and Christian. In the Muslim situation, it's called Waqf or Awqaf, whereby associations uh, have the land and they work the land and they earn money and they provide assistance to poor people, etc., etc. The Maronite Church is the largest landowner of Lebanon. It alone owns more than 23% of the land of the country. That's why when you come here and you visit, you see there are so many monasteries all over the place. This land belongs, it doesn't belong to the people. And of course, in the old days, about 100 years ago, when the Ottoman Empire was ruling over this place, you remember that the Ottomans had created the Mutasarrifiya because they could not go to the mountains of Lebanon. It was too hard to climb up in those days. And there were no helicopters to go. And there were, you had to go up on a donkey. And to go up on a donkey for 1,000, 2,000 meters up, it took, uh, it, even, even the, the mighty Ottomans could not get up there that easily. So therefore, they created the Mutasarrifiya, which is a system that allowed the Christians to actually have their monasteries and, and the land, and etc. They did not even bother. And people forget that in 1915, 1916, half of the population of Lebanon starved to death because the Ottomans cut all the food in this country. So therefore, the clergy had a kind of presence throughout the country and they, and they invested in the land. The land is what they really created as a bond between them and the people. But they are the owners at the end of the day, let's not forget, the land belongs to the clergy. Same for the Muslim uh, cler clerics, and they, they are very wealthy. On top of which, the Muslim clerics get also monthly stipends from the government. They get salaries from the Lebanese government uh, in order to continue their, their, their work. Now, uh, let me close by saying the following. This clerical presence is a, is a very sophisticated system because it manipulates the system. It, it presents itself as having divine coverage, as I say, political divinity. Here, here what the Lebanese have done in exceptional skill, they put God to work. They put God to work for them. <laughs> I mean, think about this. This, this is sad. This is really sad. And uh, God is an employee in their eyes in order, to, in order to advance their interests. And, but this is getting out of hand now. Two weeks ago, the patriarch of the Maronite community finally stepped up and said, enough is enough. What we want is we want to have the sovereignty of Lebanon preserved, and we want to create a, a, a neutral state. He wants neutrality a la Austria or a la Switzerland. And of course, everybody is opposed to this. Nobody wants neutrality. Of course, Hezbollah does not want neutrality. The president's party does not want neutrality because they are the ones that are benefiting from the system. The $2 billion of electricity goes straight in their pockets. And the other 17 communities, they're all benefiting from the system as well. Now, if you pick any serious newspaper around the world, you will read about the impoverishment of Lebanon on a more or less systematic way. The 1% that ruled this country has essentially wiped out the middle class. Today, uh, suicides are increasing in the country. In 2019, I checked this up before I got the, on, this, on this Zoom program. In 2019, 175 Lebanese committed suicide. So far this year, 70. Again, remember, this is a very small country. It has only 5 million people. Poverty is now common on a relatively uh, sophisticated people uh, led by very corrupt officials who could care less. In Tripoli, Lebanon, about a month ago, a gentleman committed suicide because he could not buy a small piece of bread to his 
five-year-old daughter. That piece of bread cost one, 1,000 Lebanese pounds, which before the events was only worth 20 cents. Now it's worth even less than that. He could not even afford that. The United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees is feeding about a million and a half Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Now add on top of which about half a million Lebanese who are receiving financial and food assistance on a daily basis. 150,000 families, that's approximately 500 to 600,000 mouth to feed every day. Every day, food is being distributed to these individuals, mostly in the north, in Tripoli, not in Beirut, but mostly in Tripoli in the north. And the future is very bleak. Uh, the Lebanon has sealed, now I think it's paid as a failed state. The system is corrupt. It cannot be fixed, I'm afraid. I am very pessimistic about the future of Lebanon. And I think all the money in the world that is provided in terms of assistance to this country will go to naught unless there are very strict contingency rules applied. Now, I've spoken about for half an hour. I will stop here and I will let you ask me the questions that you want. Uh, hopefully, I did not uh, bombard you with too many numbers, but, uh, but I wanted you to get a feel for what was going on. And it's, it's a very tragic situation, day in and day out. Everyone that is, that is involved, that lives in this country, that is part of the system, laments the fact that people are losing it. People are becoming, uh, half of the population is living, is living on Prozac. Everybody is taking all kinds of medicine to stay awake at night uh, and, and, and to sleep sometimes. Uh, Everything is very expensive now. The economy is in trouble and the government is telling us everything is fine. Don't worry. As long as we're in charge, you'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. For